I'm not an EMT. I, I'm not even qualified to the state anymore, which was through Texas. And I do not practice my skills. And I never did professionally, okay? I just got my degree and then never did anything with it. So there you go. Fair enough. No worry. I'm not out there wandering the streets that uh, as an unqualified paramedic, okay? Wait, so you're telling me at our last fishing tournament, when I almost drowned and you gave me mouth to mouth, you weren't qualified to do that? I just did that out of fun. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. So do you got any stories for free talk, Dan? Man, do I have any stories? Uh, no EMT stories, because I was never an EMT. Um, shoot. I don't know what kind of stories you want to hear. I don't know. You just got any stories in general? I don't know why when you were telling us telling your stories, I was thinking back when uh, when I worked at the nuke plant in Wisconsin, where we had to wear the what are those things called? The hooded respirators, the ones the big white hoods with the clear shields. Pappers. Pappers. God, I hate those things. Yep, I had to rebuild those. Yeah, I was uh, partly in charge of re-putting the filters on and all that stuff, hoses, taping them up. But uh, when we had to wear them, uh, I had this one girl working with me as we were deconning, um, like a, we were deconning a lift that they were using, and we were in there for about an hour, and I kept looking up at this girl working with me, and her face shield just kept fogging up. I'm just looking at her, but like she's working, just still working, just keeps going. And I'm just like, what the hell? She didn't have her papper turned on. That shit was not turned on at all. Yep. And I looked at her just like, I was just like, are you having a hard time breathing? <laughs> and she looked at me, she's just like, I mean, it's a little tough, but I'm okay. I was like, oh my God. I was like, turn, ar- I'm like, turn around real quick. And I turn around and I look and her papper's off. And like I flipped it on and all of a sudden like her she- like facial just like cleared up. And she's like, oh, that's better. I'm like, no shit. You had no air. <laughs> like, how are you still alive? Oh, man. Yeah, that's insane. Man. Dude, she had like lungs of steel or something. <laughs> I'm surprised she didn't fall out from rebreathing in her uh, breaths. That's what I'm saying. You know? Because like we were in those for a long time. Yeah. Because, you know, they put you in those and then they just toss you in there and then they're just like, all right, get the job done. It doesn't matter how long. Yeah. I had to deal with those last outage during Steam Generator since I was the Steam Generator lead. I had to dress out a lot of people with those pappers on. Those things weren't that bad. I mean, it was fun sitting there for hours just rebuilding them, you know? Dude, putting them together, that thing's fun. Yeah. But just getting people undressed out of them just kind of sucks. Y'all were actually using pappers and not the... Big blow up Delta suits. So we were using Delta suits during like um, during nozzle dams and stuff like that. Whenever they get into the nasty stuff, mm. but when they were just doing general work and like pushing probes and stuff like that, we were just using pappers. Oh, because they just had the guy just. I don't want to say too much, but they just had them sitting inside there to keep an eye on it as it worked. Yep. Yep. See, I've worked nuked a little bit. I know a little bit of how things go. Oh, you know how it goes. You know how it goes, baby boy. Oh, they they loved me on steam generators. I was the steam generator decon guy. Yeah, luckily I'll never have to work another outage again in my life. Hopefully, fingers crossed. We'll see. Cavity decon was the worst. That's the one thing I hated. Yeah. But everything else wasn't too bad. All right. Well, you have anything else you want to add to today's episode or anything, Dan? Well, I, I just hope everyone enjoyed this episode. I'm, if not, I'm sorry. It was a rough week. But we got it done. Hopefully it's good quality stuff for you. Yep. Next week we got some pretty good episodes. I'm not going to say what they are, but they're pretty spicy for the next few weeks, actually. So we go pretty deep in some crazy stuff. Let me, let me look at this list. I want to see what we have spicy coming up. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that one's pretty spicy. The following week is very, very spicy. And the one after that is pretty damn spicy, too. Oh. The next three weeks are going to be pretty insane regarding episodes. All the way till the end of March. March? Yep. All right. Well, that's the end of the episode today. So I want to thank you for joining us. And again, thank you for your support. Seriously, it means a lot to me and Dan. 
and we love you for it and we appreciate you for it not only for just for the support but just you know being there for us through everything dude 100 you know listeners is like family members you know yeah. so um with that being said dan you want to roll us out sure will. it's okay to be out of this world with your thoughts because you are not alone of the third kind. Welcome. First off, I want to say thank you to whomever you are listening for opening your minds to receive these extra knowledge nuggets each week. It means a lot to me and Aaron, and I want you to know that. Also, before we start, since you are a Patreon subscriber, remember that you get priority in topic suggestions. So feel free to send those suggestions on over to us, either by email, Instagram, Facebook, Discord direct message, or you can write us a letter and send it to our PO box. So today's episode is over the Angels Landing Cult. So how this episode will go today is that we'll talk a little bit about how this cult started, who's involved, and what happened during this entire crazy thing. And then of course we're transitioning into theories and then our personal thoughts and theories and then into free talk. All right, so with that being said, let's get into today's episode. It all began in the 90s. A despicable man would start to carry out such foul deeds. Moving from state to state, he preyed on women of all ages, especially the young. He lived off the unfortunate events of others to fulfill his lifestyle. Only after more than a decade would someone connect the dots of these crimes. This is the Angels Landing Cult. All right, so before we dive into how this cult started, we first wanted to give you a trigger warning because this episode is a pretty bad one and there's gonna be a lot of bad things happening in this. So if you're sensitive to- Sex crimes. Yeah, sex crimes, then uh, you might wanna fast forward in some parts, you know, just to give you a fair warning. All right, so Dan, can you start it off for us and tell us how this cult all got started? Of course. So usually when we start an episode about a cult, we start off by going through the life of the person that started it all. Oddly enough, there was actually very little information on the early life of Daniel Perez. The only information we were able to find out is that he was born in Aransas, Texas in 1959. He may have served in the Navy and worked on airplanes. Now, where the story actually begins would be in the mid-1990s with Daniel Perez living in Texas still at the time. Now, he met a woman named Patricia Gomez, who people often called Trish. I guess that was her nickname, you know. So Trish and Daniel Perez uh, dated for a while, but things didn't quite work out for the two. But they did kind of remain friends. Then in April of 1996, Daniel Perez had met another woman named Marilyn, and at the time, she had a son and a 14-year-old daughter named Michelle. Now, Marilyn and her little small family were in the process of moving to Amarillo, but they had nowhere to stay during this transition period. So Daniel Perez, being the nice guy that he is at the time, allowed the family to stay with him for a few weeks during their transition period. This is where Perez would start to commit his crime spree. While Marilyn and her kids were staying with him, he would force Michelle, the 14-year-old daughter, to have sex with him on multiple occasions. He would continue to rape Michelle throughout the stay and continue to do so after the family had moved out of his apartment. 
Later on, charges would be filed against Perez for the raping of Michelle. He would plead guilty in court to these charges, but something happened. Daniel Perez's body was found in Mexico. Like his dead body? His dead body. Oh, so he just came up poop dead. That's right. As soon as he pled guilty, got out, he was found dead. Mm. Okay. So the body was found in Mexico, and it had matched the size and age of Daniel Perez, along with a photo ID with the name Daniel Perez. So the investigators assumed at the time that, you know, Daniel Perez might have fled and that he had died. So they closed the case. The police assumed Daniel Perez was gone, but later on, it was actually found out that it wasn't Daniel Perez, that he set all of this up. And when he was questioned about it, he stated that he was abducted by four uniformed men and they beat the living hell out of him and left him for dead. And he wasn't sure if he was dumped in Texas or Mexico. Then he claims that Trish, his friend from a while back, had found him and had taken him to some people that cared for him until he recovered. Then once he was well enough, he ended up moving to Corpus Christi, Texas. Now all this time, he found some other random dead body and they assumed he was dead and they closed the case on him, you know? At least that's what he says. Yeah. So yeah. So Daniel is back in Corpus Christi right now. The police still don't know that he's back in Corpus Christi. They just thought he died because they found a random body, but in reality, he just disappeared. So he didn't stay in Corpus Christi for long. So by the summer of 1996, he had packed up and moved to North Dakota. Perez at this time was about 46 years old, but he had met a girl, a 15 year old girl named Catherine, who thought he was actually much younger than what he was. Then Perez would soon start a relationship with her. Sexual relationship? A sexual relationship. Jesus Christ. Yep. Now Perez was already a scumbag and a rapist, but during his relationship with Catherine, he decided to add another title to his name, a seer. He convinced Catherine that he could make it rain or see someone's past, present, and future lives. Also claimed that he could communicate with the other side. Oh my god. Alright, so after three months of Catherine and Daniel Perez seeing one another, uh, the relationship came to an end when law enforcement came to Catherine's home and arrested Perez, which then they deported him back to Mexico. Now, Daniel was a United States citizen, but that didn't really matter to them. They just deported his ass to Mexico, even though he was a United States citizen. So for the next year, Daniel kept trying to get in contact with Catherine over the phone, but never told her where he was currently living. Now, Daniel had actually gone back to Corpus Christi, Texas, but this time he was no longer known as Daniel Perez. He created a new identity for himself, and he called himself Lou Castro. So of course, you know, Daniel Perez, or now known as Castro, wasn't single for very long. He had now met a woman named Mona Griffith, who lived in the same apartment complex as he did in Corpus Christi. It didn't take long for Castro to get Mona to move in with him, along with her son, Cody, and 14-year-old daughter, Lindsay. Then to add more to it, Patricia Gomez, aka Trish, for some reason ended up moving into a nearby apartment complex near him. So keep that in mind. She's always around. She is. So now the group of them uh, were all close together. They decided that they didn't want to stay in Corpus Christi. So within the next few months, they had moved to Wichita, Kansas. But Mona's son, Cody, refused to go and decided to stay with his father instead. Now Castro still had contact with Catherine in which she moved with the group to Kansas, but only stayed for two weeks before returning to North Dakota to finish school. Now, after she left, Castro, AKA Daniel Perez, took the group and moved to South Dakota, which it seemed like he always kept trying to keep on the move, especially after, you know, his last incident with Catherine and him getting arrested. He was always on the move, trying to, you know, evade the law, the law. Of course, Trish was also with him, but she ended up meeting a man named Brian Hughes, and they began a romantic relationship which led to them getting married. 
But it wasn't just Trish who met someone else though. Mona also met a man named Jim 